The epistle appointed to be read for the Quinquagesima Sunday is taken from the first letter of St. Paul the Apostle to the, his, to the Corinthians. Brethren, if I speak with the tongues of men and of angels, but have not charity, I become as a sounding brass or a tinkling cymbal. And if I should have prophecy and should know all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I should have all faith so that I could remove mountains and have not charity, I'm nothing. And if I should distribute all my goods to feed the poor, and if I should deliver up my body to be burned, and have not charity, it profiteth me nothing. Charity is patient, is kind. Charity envieth not, it, to be, it dealeth not perversely, it is not puffed up, it is not ambitious, it seeketh not her own, it is not provoked to anger, thinketh no evil, rejoiceth not in iniquity, but rejoiceth with the truth, beareth all things, Believeth all things, hopeth all things, endureth all things. Charity never falleth away, whether prophecy shall be made void, or tongues shall cease, or knowledge shall be destroyed. For we know in part, and we prophesy in part, but when that which is perfect is come, that which is part shall be done away with. When I was a child, I spoke as a child. I understood as a child. I thought as a child. But when I became a man, I put away the things of a child. We see now through a glass in a dark manner, but then face to face. Now I know in part, but then I shall know even as I am known. And now there remain faith, hope, and charity, these three. But the greatest of these is charity. Please stand for the Holy Gospel, which is taken from the Gospel according to St. Luke. At that time, Jesus took unto him the twelve and said to them, Behold, we go up to Jerusalem, and all things shall be accomplished which were written by the prophets concerning the Son of Man. For he shall be delivered to the Gentiles, and shall be mocked and scourged and spit upon. And after they have scourged him, they will put him to death. And the third day he shall rise again. And they understood none of these things. And this word was kept from them, and they understood not the things that were being said. Now it came to pass that when he drew nigh to Jericho, a certain blind man sat by the wayside begging. And when he heard the multitude passing by, he asked, What did this mean? And they told him that Jesus of Nazareth was passing by. And he cried out, saying, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. And they that went before rebuked him that he should hold his peace. But he cried out much more, Son of David, have mercy on me. And Jesus, standing, commanded him to be brought to him. And when he was come near, he asked him, saying, What wilt I do to thee? But he said, Lord, that I may see. And Jesus said to him, Receive thy sight, thy faith hath made thee whole. And immediately he saw and followed him, glorifying God. And all the people, when they saw it, gave praise to God. Thus far the words of today's holy gospel. Please be seated. Welcome once again to our little chapel here, uh, St. John Bosco Mission. And uh, please do take a bulletin home with you. Uh, it has all the important uh, announcements in it. And this, of course, is Quinquagesima Sunday, the last Sunday before we begin the uh, athleticism of, of Lent. See, there's just a couple of, of things that are mentioned here. Oh, I need to. So you. Okay, we'll not. We will not be able to be here. A priest will not be able to be here on Ash Wednesday. I do apologize for that. But rather next Sunday, we will distribute ashes to uh, all who who arrive. Um, the mass next Sunday will be uh, not at the usual time of four, but rather at twelve. 30 in the, uh, every, in the afternoon. So half past noon next Sunday will be Mass here with um, uh, confessions, of course, beforehand. And uh, I guess they're, they feel that we're underfed because you're asked to show your gratitude for the Mass by volunteering to host the visiting priest and driver for a meal after Mass. Now, I don't ha have a driver. I drive myself, so uh, it's just I want to feed you, you be appreciated. I always appreciate a good meal. And as I told people, I'm on a seafood diet, so by seafood I eat it. So, no, no drug 
others. Um, do look at the upcoming uh, men's retreat uh, for 2023 and, uh, and the women's retreat as well. They are listed in the bulletin as well. If you haven't made a retreat in a while, it might be a good idea to set some time aside and make a retreat. The retreats are uh, here in California, in Los Gatos. Uh, for men, there will be one, two, three, four this year. And uh, the rest are in Ridgefield, uh, Connecticut. Uh, women, same thing. And so let us, oh, no, there's more here. Um, proper attire. Oh, just read that, read that over the proper attire thing. And also, please leave your cell phones in your car. If one goes off during Mass, I will turn around and look at you and wait until you take it out of the car to avoid that embarrassment and take it out before Mass. I should have said that before I started Mass, but that's all right. Make sure it's off. And if you are not registered yet to, and come, come to Mass here, please do register so that we have your details and are able to give you information uh, to, uh, that you might need uh, over, over time. Um, Sundays of the month, the next, uh, the first Sunday of the month, are, are we give blessings of, of religious articles that you might have. And second Sunday, there's adult catechism. Um, and third Sunday, there's extra confessions after Mass. Um, and fourth Sunday is benediction. And uh, that's, I think, all of the announcements. So do take this home, please. And let us kneel down and we'll say in our Father, Hail Mary, and the glory be for the repose of the souls of our faithful departed. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Ghost. As it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. The eternal rest grant unto them, O Lord. And let perpetual light shine upon them. May their souls and the souls of all the faithful departed. The mercy of God rest in peace. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. Unless you do penance, you shall die. Those are words taken from St. Luke's Gospel. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. So my dear friends, the modern church, the modernist church, um, as with everything else they preach and teach, has so confused and so corrupted traditional Catholic doctrine as to render it meaningless and irrelevant, and so impossible of our observing it in our da daily lives, much less of any usefulness or utility that it might have, should have, uh, in saving our souls. So even moder modernist Catholics sense this, and still retaining some ability of clear thinking, they may protest to their priests, Father, I don't want to commit sin and go to hell. What therefore must I do during Lent to have a good Lent and to avoid sin and hell? So we're going to touch upon that tonight. However, uh, the modern priest will call him Father Bob. Father Bob may reply, oh, tut, tut, my dear, don't worry about hell. God is good. God will never send anyone to hell, even if it exists. Don't worry, be happy. Uh-huh. Well, we know that not to be true, that hell does exist. Our Lord spoke about it many times. And he wouldn't therefore come down and die on the cross were there no hell to be avoided. So there is a hell and we need to do what we can to make sure we don't go there. But even more importantly, that we uh, be worthy and able to go to, to heaven after this life is over. Remember, I've told you before, the, the, best, the best words you'll ever hear in this world or the next, probably the next, will be the next when God says to you, Well done, good and faithful servant, enter into the joy of the Lord. You won't hear that when you leave this life. Well... We'll have to worry about that later, but let's worry about it now. So, what I quoted to you, do penance lest you die, Jesus follows that with a parable. And he, the parable goes like this. A certain man had a fig tree planted in his vineyard, and he came seeking fruit on it, and he didn't find any. And he said to the dresser of the vineyard, Behold, for these three years I come seeking fruit on this fig tree, and I find none. Cut it down, therefore. Why cumbereth it, why cumbereth it the ground? 
But the vine dresser, which is uh, part of in the parable, that's the church, that's the Pope, the St. Peter, that's the priest. The vine dresser answering said to him, Lord, let it alone this year also until I dig about it and dung it. And if happily it shall bear fruit, or and, and, and if happily it bear fruit. But if not, then after that thou shalt cut down, cut the fig tree down. Now the fig tree is all of us, so each one of us is a fig tree. And we're supposed to bear fruit. And the fruit of the fig tree represents our virtues and the good deeds that we must have and do in order to go to heaven. And as for the dung, well, I'm sure you must know what that is. It's one of these things you definitely don't want to pick up with your bare hands. And dung represents penance and is, in this life, the most effective form of fertilizer for producing fruit, just as penance is the most effective form of fertilizer, spiritual fertilizer, for producing the spiritual fruit necessary to go to heaven. And like dung, penance is not pleasant to handle. Now, while there are many forms of penance, of spiritual dung, if you will, those which the Holy Mother of the Church has traditionally imposed on all of her faithful are, you know them well, fasting and abstinence. And this is simply because hunger and thirst are universally unpleasant experiences, rarely uh, mortal, rarely deadly. But in moderate doses, they don't injure health. In fact, uh, quite the opposite. And if you doubt that, ask anyone who's trying to lose weight. There, the pen, or Holy Mother, the Church has treated penance, especially these two forms, fasting and abstinence, uh, throughout its history, and has always assigned these two forms of penance as the usual forms of penance. There are other things you can do too, as well, but fasting and abstinence are the ones that the Holy Mother, the Church has always assigned. We've had two versions of canon law. A uh, canon law uh, is the law that governs the church and governs us faithful, governs priests, governs the entire church. And uh, the law has been changed once. It was originally formulated. There was, there were laws in the church. It was rather complicated before uh, Pope St. Pius X came along and uh, c codified uh, the canon law. And it was published after his death in the 1917 Code of Canon Law. However, in 1983, Pope John the or uh, John Paul II, the third, John Paul II, excuse me, uh, decided to redo it and promulgate a revised version of canon law in 1983. And we want to look at this because you see, law, whatever it may be, is the law that binds uh, binds us if we're you know if we're subject to it. Um, we see this all the time. And the one thing you have to keep about law, keep in mind about law is that if it doesn't mention it, then it is not applied to us. If it is not part of the law, then we don't have to be concerned about it. And I want to let you know what currently, in 19, the 1983 Code of Canon Law, universally imposes and is frequently dispensed or mitigated by, by many bishops. So there's four canons, they're called canons. There are four canons that uh, apply to uh, the penitential days uh, of fasting and abstinence. The first one is Canon 1250. The penitential days and times in the Universal Church are every Friday of the whole year and the season of Lent. And the next one, Canon 1251, abstinence from meat or from other foods as determined by the Episcopal Conference is to be observed on all Fridays unless a solemnity should fall on a Friday. Abstinence <laughs> and fasting are to be observed on Ash Wednesday and Good Friday. The next canon, 1252, the law of abstinence binds those who have completed their 14th year. The law of fasting binds those who have attained their majority, age 18, until the beginning of their 60th year. Pastors of souls and parents are to ensure that even those who by reason of their age are not bound by the laws of fasting and abstinence are at least taught the true meaning of penance. And the final canon is a bit of a, a conundrum here, canon 1253. The conference of bishops can determine more precisely the observance of fast and abstinence as well as substitute other forms of penance, especially works of charity and exercises of piety in whole or in part for abstinence and fasting. This canon is one that 
we get we learn about this in, in the seminary. We get we we're, we're exposed to the old code, nineteen seventeen, and the new code, nineteen eighty three. And uh, I remember Father Peter Scott, and some of you may remember, he was very careful to identify those canons in the new code of canon law which we uh, have to perhaps adjust a bit, or even we cannot we cannot obey because they're simply uh, they're simply bad laws. And as Saint Augustine has said, a bad law is no law at all. If the law is bad, you don't have to obey it, but you may have to suffer the punishment if you don't. But at any rate. So it says here, the conference of bishops can determine more precisely the observance of fast and abstinence. When I was a child, and many of you when you were children too, there was no such thing as a conference of Catholic bishops. The bishop was the supreme authority in his diocese. Nobody told him what to do except the Pope. Otherwise, he did what he thought was best according to canon law and his own proper judgment as, as the circumstances uh, dictated. So we had these Conference of Catholic Bishops. We had a National Conference of Catholic Bishops here in the United States, the NS, uh, NCCB, the National Conference of Catholic Bishops. Um, and in the beginning, when these Conference of Catholic Bishops were formed, this is back in the 70s, um, some bishops were upset. They said, well, wait a minute. Um, I have the authority in my diocese. What, what, what is my relationship with this Conference of Bishops? This means that all the bishops in the United States, they come together regularly, the United States Council, Conference of Catholic Bishops, and they meet and they decide things. And some of the bishops said, well, wait a minute, um, am I now, uh, do I have an authority over me other than the Pope? So between the Pope and me is now this conference. Oh, no, 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 no. They're merely going to be advisory. They're, they're, they will exert no authority at all. At the time, young as I was, I thought to myself, well, yeah, right, that's not going to happen. And it's not. When they say in a canon here that the, the Conference of Bishops can determine more precisely the observance of fast and well, that, that's a juridical thing that they're doing. They don't have that authority. That was what we were told. So that's one problem, one problem in that canon. And then it goes on to say, as well as they, can, they, the Conference of Bishops, can substitute other forms of penance. Remember we said that penance is like dung. Well, dung is not a pleasant thing. And in some of these works of, 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 or some of these penances, they describe as works of charity, exercises of piety, in whole or in part for abstinence and fast. So uh, instead of fasting and abstinence, you can maybe smell a rose. I, I'm not joking. I've, I've actually heard a priest say that for your penance, smell a rose. All right. The problem with this is that you cannot substitute acts of charity and exercises of piety for penance because penance is meant to be uh, it's meant to be um, difficult and meant to deprive us of something that we normally like to give it up to God. So no, that's not that's that's definitely not not a uh, you cannot make charity and exercises of piety to substitute for abstinence. You cannot do that. Now the bishop here, of course, follows these canons. I want to show you, however, how they differ these canons for fasting and abstinence. Uh, from what was in the 1917 code. In the 1917 code, you can find that if you have one of these, I don't know, I'm not sure whether we're making these available to you in the back, are we? So these are beautiful calendars, by the way, and on the back page are the answers to most of the questions you're gonna ask, uh, ask the priest. And it has here, uh, it has the guidelines for observing traditional penitential days. So the Society of St. Pius X, we cannot make laws. I cannot, um, the, the Superior General of the Society of St. Pius X cannot abrogate any church law. Um, we're accused of doing that, but we don't. We can't. It's impossible. We're not the lawmaker. The lawmaker is the Pope, and, uh, is, and, and the laws are, are in, 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 the, in, the, in the Code of Canon Law. But what we do do, what we do try to do in the society is we try to encourage people to follow the old canons, the old law, the old laws, uh, out of piety um, and out of uh, to observe. And so, I, I want to. Uh, you can see this in 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 the in the calendar. This is the these are the guidelines for observing traditional penitential days. And the law of abstinence then bound all Catholics, meaning on the day after their seventh birthday. So now it's fourteen. The law of fasting back then bound all Catholics beating on the day after their 21st birthday and ended on midnight, which completed their 59th birthday. No change, same, same today. The law of abstinence forbade the eating of flesh meat and broth made of meat 
but did not exclude the use of eggs, milk, milk products, or seedlings made from the fat of animals, bacon fat, for example, if you want to cook your eggs in, a, in, in bacon fat, it's very flavorful, you may do that. The law of fasting prescribed only that one full meal a day be taken, but did not forbid a small amount of food in the morning and in the evening. Now, the current, um, the current law of uh, fasting uh, here in, in San Diego, um, In San Diego, um, it says that you must, you may have, you may have uh, whatever customary number of meals you have, but none of them can can equal one uh, one full meal. So you have one full meal and whatever. But in the old days, of course, it was there was you normally just breakfast, lunch, and dinner, and dinner might have been the main meal, or lunch might have been the main meal. That was one full meal on days of fast. No no meat at at, at any of those meals, and um, they were uh, and then. Uh, and that, and then, and no, no eating in between meals. Going on here in the United States, it was tailored by um, by the bishops, uh, each individual bishop. Uh, they Sundays throughout the year and holy days of obligation outside of Lent are canceled. Uh, canceled the fasting and or abstinence of any penitential day which coincided with a first class feast. A solemnity. If a fast day vigil fell, fell, fell on Sunday, the fasting and abstinence associated with the vigil were not anticipated on the Saturday, but dropped altogether that year. So no, no fasting on those. The vigil of all saints no longer exists. It did once upon a time. Abstinence back then was obligatory on all Fridays, except on holy days of obligation outside of Lent. Fast, this is the old days. Fasting and complete, abs, complete abstinence were obligatory on the following days. Ash Wednesday, all Fridays of Lent, Good Friday, all Fridays of Lent, Good Friday, Holy Saturday until noon, the end of Easter, the end of Easter, Vigil Mass, the Vigils of Assumption and Christmas, and Ember Fridays. And also, it, they were obligatory on all Fridays of the year. So that's the difference between the old law and the new law. The old law insisted that we abstain from meat every Friday of the year. It also insisted that we abstain from meat uh, on ember days and on uh, vigils of major feasts. Those are all gone now. In the new law, you are only obliged to abstain on uh, Fridays of Lent. Frequently, too, bishops will tell people, well, you can substitute something else, smell of rose, say a rosary, whatever, uh, for that. And so they effectively remove abstinence entirely from the calendar. The only two uh, days that you must fast and abstain are still kept, and that's Ash Wednesday, Good Friday. In the old days of Lent, um, you've had to fast every day during Lent except Sunday. So fasting obliged in, in the old, under the old calendar, or the old law, every single day of Lent. Uh, two small meals, which may not equal one meal, and one meal, which may not uh, which may not, um, which you may have in, in the United States, you may have meat at that meal. That was called partial abstinence. That was only in the United States. The rest of the world, it was total abstinence uh, during Lent, and of course, the fasting was all of the weekdays of the of the year, or of the of of, uh, of the year. Uh, note: This is the old law again. Liquids, including milk and fruit juices, might be taken at any time on the day of fast. But other works of charity, piety, and prayer for the Pope should be substituted. But that's, of course, in the modern the modern sense. And American Catholics, we had a dispensation from Pope Pius XII to, uh, from abstinence on the Friday following Thanksgiving Day. So we could enjoy Turkey on Friday as well after, after Thanksgiving. So at the end of the day, at the end of, the, of this, um, during Lent, for us here in the United States, there are only two days of fast, only two. It used to be every day, every weekday before, and that's Ash Wednesday and Good Friday. Um, you have to abstain on only on Fridays of Lent for the rest of the year, apparently not. People do confess to me that they, they eat on Friday and uh, because they think it's still a sin to do so. Um, it's not, but remember the, the law of the church is we must do penance, so in, that's a perfect, that's a, a perfect Penance to do is the traditional penance of the church is fasting and uh, and, abs and abstinence, and so 
<laughs> we haven't even touched this other, the other thing, which is of course the Eucharistic fast, and what is it now as opposed to what it was. Uh, when I was a child, um, the Eucharistic fast meant that before you received Holy Communion on Sunday or any day at all, you were required to abstain entirely from the midnight before until the reception of Holy Communion the day, uh, the following day. You had to abstain even from water. If you drank water, that broke the fast, you couldn't go to Holy Communion. Then Pope Pius XII, he changed that to water is okay anytime, as you know, and uh, three hours was the fast. And then Pope Paul VI changed it further by making one hour the time of the fast before going to Holy Communion. Well, my friends, if we, if we normally space our meals as normal people do, there's about five hours between each meal during the day. And of course, from dinner, the, uh, dinner at night until breakfast the next morning, there's easily 12 or more hours. So that's, I mean, so how can three hours or even one hour, certainly one hour be a fast? There's no such thing. It's, it's, it has completely nullified the fast entirely. And of course, with a one hour fast before Holy Communion, that means you can have a full breakfast of bacon and eggs and hash brown potatoes and come up to communion later on, uh, an hour later, uh, burping uh, uh, bacon. Um, so that's, that's hardly a fast. So the uh, things have changed quite a bit in this regard. And so here we, in the society, we recommend, uh, strongly recommend for the good of your souls that you try to follow the traditional uh, fasting and abstinence um, rather than try than, than what is now uh, really amounts to just two days, Ash Wednesday and Good Friday. So if you can do that, that would be good. There are other practices, of course, that you can follow. Uh, children typically give up uh, sweets, candy, um, and there are other things you can do. You can, you can abstain from the internet, maybe. Um, you can nourish in that vacuum left by abstaining from the internet. You can nourish your, your, your mind and your souls by reading good books. Uh, it doesn't have to be just exclusively spiritual books. Um, I'm, I'm concerned because I find that most people read nothing or very little. They, they read the newspaper, but why read the newspaper? You can see with all that on the internet. They don't read any books at all, and it has been determined that uh, prolonged exposure to electronic media definitely damages the brain. It's one of the major causes they're finding uh, for dementia, uh, whether it be Alzheimer's or just simple dementia, because the brain is like a muscle. It has to be exercised in order to keep its strength, its vigor, its vitality. If it's not exercised like your muscles, it will diminish and become useless. And that's what happens with these because um, electronic media does not exercise the brain. You simply sit there and get bombarded with somebody else's thoughts and impressions, and these become your own because you're not really using your brain to judge or, or to uh, uh, consider what's being said to you. And so it would be, especially during Lent, a good thing if you got away from that entirely, got away from the internet, got away from all that, of course your job might, might require you to do that, but it would be good if you got away from that. Get some good spiritual books. I, I, I don't think we have any books here for, uh, not, we don't, do we have a bookstore here? I don't think we have a bookstore here. Do we have a bookstore here? It's coming. All right, coming soon. Stay tuned. We're gonna, we will have a bookstore. So consider what you will do for Lent. Uh, it is a beautiful time of the year. I know we all kind of approach it with a bit of trepidation because, oh, Lent. You know, can't eat this and can't do that and can't, you know, so on and so on. But once you get into it, pay attention, especially if you have a daily missal. I know you can't go to the daily mass, but if you have a daily missal, your reading could be the readings from each day's missal. The Lenten uh, masses, all the weekdays and the Sundays, are absolutely brilliant, absolutely brilliant. Uh, the church, in putting these together, has focused and arranged the readings from sacred scripture so as to lead us inexorably towards that day, of course, when we. Uh, appear before with Our Lady uh, at the foot of the cross as her son is on the cross, redeeming us from all sin and opening the, the, the gates of heaven for us. And so with these few words, if I hope I haven't confused you, um, I would like to wish all of you a good and holy Lent, uh, and of course under the protective mantle of our Blessed Mother's grace. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. Amen. Amen.